Hi, this is an overview of how to take fluorescence intensity measurements with the TCAN Spark Microplate Reader and Spark Control software. With your reader and computer turned on and the status light of the reader at Magenta, launch the Spark Control dashboard software and once in the dashboard, you'll click on the Method Editor New button to begin writing a method. The first step in the creation of any method is to select a plate definition to match the plate you're using I want to first explain though that I'm using these fluorescent highlighter pens on this clear microplate where the pens have been drawn across the bottom to create some signal. If you're ever in a pinch for a fluorescent standard or something to at least test the functioning of your instrument, then pens like these are very useful. So in this example, we're going to select a clear, flat, transparent microplate. And uh, for this video, you cannot see the drop down list here, but if you could, it would look a little bit like this, where you could scroll up and down and select from a variety of different plates. And if you don't find the plate that you're looking for, you would contact TCAN and they could help provide you with the correct definition. It's worth noting that if you're measuring solutions of fluorescence, that an all black plate is the best way to go. Whereas if you're measuring adherent cells or you have a lid on the plate, then a black walled plate with a clear bottom is best. Again, for our example, we're using a clear plate, and here we're going to click and drag across the wells we want to measure, and then click and drag and drop the fluorescence intensity strip into the screen. You don't have to put a name here, but I'm going to type in yellow pen just as a way to reference the reading, and then the decision is whether to read from the top for homogeneous solutions of fluorescence, or if there are adherent cells, then we could read from the bottom uh, even though there's marking pen on the bottom of this plate and it might make sense to read there, I am going to read from the top to demonstrate some other features. The next step will be to select our excitation and emission wavelengths and depending on the instrument you have, it may be equipped with filters or tunable wavelength monochromators or even a combination of both called fusion. In this case, I've got a fusion instrument so I have both selection of filters and monochromators and just for the sake of showing you the filters, they are loaded on what's called filter slides through the front of the instrument. Each filter slide for excitation and emission holds six filters and users can customize these slides holders with different filters as they see necessary. The filters have fixed bandwidths of course, but the monochromator mechanism on the Spark can be either a fixed bandwidth system if you have a standard Spark or it can have variable bandwidth if it is a enhanced fluorescent spark. And the enhanced model has adjustable bandwidth from 5 to 50, and while you can't see it in this display here, if you click on these fields, you can select different bandwidths to be used during measurements. When entering your wavelength and bandwidth settings, it's important to understand the minimum distance rule the minimum distance is the distance that must exist between excitation and emission wavelength settings in order to prevent what's called spectral overlap. It's also known as crosstalk. And crosstalk can result in high background during your readings that looks like fluorescence when it's not. Here's an example where the wavelength settings are correct and there's low background along with some good signal. But here's what happens if the wavelength settings, in this case, where the emission is too close to the excitation, where you get much higher background in the readings. And this may look like fluorescence, but it's actually bleed through, where the excitation light is striking the sample and being collected back up through the emission optics, where it registers as signal when in fact it's just scattered light arriving at the detector from the excitation channel. To determine the minimum distance of your settings, take the bandwidth of excitation plus bandwidth of emission plus 5 nanometers, and then take the emission wavelength minus the excitation wavelength, and that difference must be greater than or equal to the minimum distance in order to avoid crosstalk. If we evaluate our current settings, the sum of the bandwidths plus 5 nanometers gives us 45 nanometers as our minimum distance, and what the current wavelength settings 535 minus 485 gives us 50 nanometers, and 50 nanometers is greater than 45, so we have not violated the minimum distance rule, and we can take readings without crosstalk. Another way to visualize how minimum distance plays into the correct settings is to go to this fluorophore list 
And in this instance, I'm going to pick fluorescein. Uh, you can't see the pull down here, but I'll bring up a screenshot to show you what it looks like. But once you have picked fluorescein or some other dye, it will show you, as in this case, the in blue, the spectral excitation profile of the dye. And in red, you'll see the emission profile. And then depending on your excitation and um, emission wavelength settings, as well as your bandwidths, you can uh, see these vertical lines here for the excitation. Those represent the wavelengths that will be passed through to the sample for excitation. And over here, the red vertical lines represent the emission wavelengths that will be collected and passed on to the detector. And you can click and drag these around to, in this case, increase the emission or decrease it. And once I violate the minimum distance rule here, which happens to be because of the bandwidth being 20 and 20 plus 5, that's 45. <clears throat> Once I get closer than 45, you'll get a little warning here indicating that this would result in a crosstalk uh, detection. And so ways to sort of overcome this would be to obviously move the wavelengths apart, but if the die was such that you wanted to be very close in terms of excitation and emission, you could adjust the bandwidth if you have an enhanced spark. So I could potentially do that, um, reduce it to 10. Now this lets me get closer to parking things over the emission. Um, alternatively, I could reduce the bandwidth on the excitation. Okay, as I'm doing this, of course, uh, I am letting less light into the sample and collecting less light back. Um, which could re result in some lower sensitivity, but um, this is something that you just have to experiment with. <clears throat> but by having narrower bandwidth, you can obviously have a smaller minimum distance between excitation and emission. I'm going to go ahead and back things out to our 20 and 20 again, and get our emission back up to a healthy minimum distance here. And now we can cover some other topics. The next step will be to click and reveal the advanced settings. For flashes, the default number of flashes per well is 30. And this is intended to give you the most ideal results for most general purpose fluorescence readings. There are instances where you can use one flash to go very quickly, but with uh, risk of there not being as much consistency as you may want. Uh, adding more flashes, like 3, 5, 10 flashes, will give you more averages per well and improve the consistency of the data while still maintaining some read speed. You can play around with different read or flash settings, but for now, in this example, I'm going to stick with about 5, and I generally stay between 5 and 10 for most applications. For the gain setting, this is how the instrument adjusts the voltage on the detector to affect how much signal is presented in the data output. And the signal range is 0 to 65,000 relative fluorescent units. So when you select optimal, this is where you do not know where the brightest sample is on the plate, and you'd like the reader to go and find that sample and adjust the voltage so that that sample's RF U value is effectively 45 to 50,000 counts. Once it finds the correct gain to generate that value, it will read the entire plate at the gain it finds. This way, you do not run the risk of any well on the plate having what's called an overvalue, where it goes beyond the range of 65,000. There is an additional option for determining gain, and that is called calculate from well. You would use this feature if you happen to know where the brightest well is on the plate. This saves the reader time of not having to go around and find the bright well on its own. So this is a little bit faster way of measuring. Again, it would go to the well you designate. It would adjust the voltage so that that sample would have a counts between 45 to about 50,000. You won't be able to see it here, but um, there is a pull-down menu visible on my screen that's not showing up in the video, but you can click on the pull-down menu and select the wells that you want it to go to do this calculation from. There is a third means of determining 
gains and it's called extended dynamic range. This is a way for the reader to use two separate gains to measure the samples and by virtue of this it can give you a much broader range of signal intensities from 0 to 6.5 million. You would use this feature if you know that you've got very very weak samples in your plate mixed in with some very very bright samples and you simply just give this a try and see what it gives you but it is a way of being able to get more range out of the instrument than you otherwise could by just measuring at one gain. Um, lastly there is a way of simply fixing the gain manually between a value of 0 to 250 where of course as you go from a small gain value to a large one you will increase the amplification of the signal and uh, you will find many cases where you've read the same assay many times and by choosing optimal gain or calculate from well you will see a very similar gain appearing for that assay and therefore you can come here and just simply type in what that gain would be so you're not always having to re-optimize each time. Uh, be mindful that ideal gains for instruments like the Spark will range between about 60 and 180. So you'll see that for very, very bright samples, the instrument, uh, depending on its settings, may try to use a very low gain, some, something under 60, or for samples that are very, very dim and, and maybe there is no fluorescence, it may come back and give you a gain that's much beyond 180. And um, the instrument can, at very high gains, produce what appears to be signal when in fact it's just amplification of noise. So again just it's best to try to operate within a range of about 60 to 180 if you can. Also on the Spark standard model you will see that there's a choice of a 50 percent mirror and a 510 dichroic mirror. If you need an exa explanation of what dichroic mirrors are please consult your TCAN manual or perhaps other videos that will be produced on this topic. But for now just know that the standard model's got a 50% and a 510, whereas the model like this one with a enhanced fluorescence optics has a choice of additional mirrors plus one user-defined mirror that you can insert and use to address other wavelengths within the range of the spectrum. For purposes of this example, I'm going to leave it out as automatic and let the reader decide which mirror to use for the wavelength settings that have been selected. Also, the Spark can move the plate carrier up and down in the Z direction, much like a microscope stage, in order to focus at the right depth within a well. If you set this to automatic or calculate from well and designate a well that you know to have some fluorescence in it, such as again, perhaps uh, sending it to F1, it doesn't have to be the well with the brightest sample, but certainly a well where you know there is definitely some representative fluorescence in that well. Then the instrument will move the plate carrier up, up and down, identify the depth at which it gets the best signal, and then it will read the entire plate at that depth. It will also report this Z position and both the gain values it's determining here in the data output so you can use those values again should you want to repeat the reading and not have to go through the exercise of making the reader determine these values a second time despite that it's going to find the same values um, on the second reading. Again, uh, there's a, re a, a parameter here called settle time. Uh, this was addressed in the absorbance video, but uh, essentially if you are using 96 well plates and you are going to fill them with more than 100 microliters, you can leave the settle time as zero. If you fill the wells with less than 100 microliters, there's a risk that some of the liquid on the surface of the well will vibrate as the plate's being moved and that vibration can be detected once the flashes are applied. So for 96 well plates, if you're going to use less than 100, you can enter values here between 100 and 500 milliseconds as a sort of a, a way of ensuring that this vibration goes away. Also, if you're going to use larger volume wells, like something between a 48 well plate and a 6 well plate, then certainly some amount of settle time is necessary here, because as those plates are moved, some of that solution begins to move around, and you don't want the solution still moving at the point in which 
readings are taken. So for those, again, you may need to go as high as a second's worth of settle time in order to get the best results. For this example today, of course, uh, there is no volume in the plate. I don't even have to worry about all settle time, so I'm going to leave it at zero. Uh, there's a more advanced feature within the software called multiple reads per well. Uh, if you were to look at this, it's sort of obvious that it's going to take additional readings at different physical points inside the well based on the number of flashes you've given it. So if I've got five here, it would flash five here, five there, and so forth, and give me individual fluorescent intensity values for these five points plus an average of those and a standard deviation for them depending on the pattern that's picked. And you can get pretty carried away with different types of patterns and densities here, uh, getting some averages from the wells if there are features in the well that you feel must be measured um, independently. So uh, that's how that feature works. You can also consult your manual or your TCAN representative for more help with this topic. For this example, we'll turn off the multiple reads per well and just use the center default read of five flashes per well in the center of each well. We will also drag and place a move plate out step into the protocol. And then this example will also go back to having optimal gain as the setting and calculate Z from well F1. And with that, we can go up here and press start and collect our measurement. The instrument will first go to well F1 and determine the optimal Z distance at which to focus. It will use that distance for measuring all the wells. It will also optimize the gain by finding the brightest well, setting the gain to make sure that well has 45 to 50,000 RFU, and it will use that gain to read all the wells in the plate. So you'd be able to tell if the instrument's doing things correctly. If you can see counts on your plate between, let's say, upwards of 45 to 50,000, and you can also see very small, uh, less intense samples that might be representative of blanks. Um, in the example here, the orange highlighter pen in the top has some fluorescence when excited at 485 and 535, whereas um, if we go back to our display here, we can see that um, pink highlighter pen does not excite and emit in this range, whereas um, the yellow highlighter pen does have excitation and emission that's pretty decent in the 485-535 range. You may also view the data as a color heat map. Um, again, it's the pink highlighter pen that's giving the most fluorescence here, The excuse me, the orange, and then the pink is very dim and the green or yellow highlighter pen not so much but still more so than the pink highlighter pen. Alright so we got to export to Excel as well. Let's see if we can find that file. It is this one here. We can see that the gain it picked was 73 so it's above 60 so that's good. Uh, it's showing us that it used the dichroic mirror, the 510, that makes sense because a 510 mirror would be able to split the light between 45 and 535. The Z position it reported is here at 16,804. So you could, if you wanted to read these uh, plates again, or this plate again, go back and fix the gain manually at 73 and the Z position at 16,804, and you'd be good to go. Here's the data. We can see that we've got values upwards of about 52,000 here. And again, some, some weaker looking signals here. And this is a good example of how there's a nice spread of signals between low and high. Now that we have some data where we've got ideal gain and ideal Z, let's go and change things so that uh, we can see how these different settings like bandwidth and wavelength and gain affect the signal. So our previous ideal gain here for this plate was 73. We're going to change the gain to 83 and we'll fix the Z at the previously determined optimal Z and run this again. So now you'll see that once we've raised the voltage on the detector by a factor, or by 10 let's say, then we're getting over values which means it's over 65,000 and it's also increased the intensities of other samples on the plate. So what's going on here is that for every change of the gain by about 10, you will see an approximate 1.8 to 2 times change in the intensity. 
Another strategy for changing the intensities of your samples while holding other things like the gain or wavelengths the same would be to alter the bandwidth. Increasing bandwidth distance makes more light and, and more signal and decreasing the bandwidth would decrease the signal. In this example, I'll go ahead and change both bandwidths to 10 so we should see less signal and we'll go ahead and read that and see what happens. And comparing this data to the previous data, you can see that the signals are now considerably smaller. Now while keeping the gain and the Z position the same, I'll change the bandwidths back to 20, but then we'll switch the excitation wavelength to something that's more ideal for the orange highlighter pen and the yellow highlighter pen. A wavelength like 450 would work well here, and we'll see what sort of result this has when we measure it again. The excitation of 450 is now driving all of the signals for the orange highlighter pen in A and B off scale, but in turn it's also a more ideal excitation for the yellow highlighter pen as you can see here by these increased signals. For the orange highlighter pen in rows A and B, a strategy for lowering the intensity there to something more acceptable would be to reduce the bandwidth on excitation and or emission to lower the gain or to move the excitation or the emission wavelengths, maybe even both, to something that are less ideal. Once you've arrived at some settings that you'd like to keep as a method, you can go up here to File and choose Save As, and while you can't see it on my screen, I'm clicking Save As. You can enter a name for the method. I'm just going to name it something like Test Method Version 1, and then when you hit Save, the software will populate the dashboard with a tile. You can see it here called Test Method Version 1. If you were to click this, it will bring up the method to run. You can open this part here and see which wells will be measured, and when you press Start, it will go right into reading. Now this is a simulation, so everything's happening quite quickly. It's not actually driving an actual reader in this example, but you can see that you get your data here and then you export to Excel. This concludes the video. I hope you've learned something useful and thank you very much for watching.